Soon after children are born, they let the world know that they are hungry. A baby's cry for food is a dramatic expression of our human need for nourishment. But meals do more than sustain the body. When a mother holds her child to her breast, she satisfies not only the need for food, but also the need for closeness and love. Meals bring people together when families gather around the dinner table, or teenagers have a pizza, or friends enjoy a meal at a restaurant. At meals, we remember an anniversary dinner. We celebrate a birthday party. We anticipate a rehearsal meal. Hello, I'm Father Mike Tuitt. Through baptism, Christ gives us a share in God's life. This life requires spiritual food and drink, which Christ provides at the Eucharist, a meal that nourishes, unites, remembers, celebrates, and anticipates. The Eucharist, or the Mass as Catholics commonly refer to it, is the central act of worship in the Catholic Church. It is being celebrated somewhere around the world, every day around the clock. It is the summit and font from which all Catholic life flows. The Eucharist, or Mass, has its roots in the Old Testament festive meals and sacrifices. The celebration at which the Jewish people recalled their deliverance from slavery in Egypt and at which Jesus celebrated the Last Supper is called Hanukkah, Pentecost, the Passover, or the Feast of Lights. Passover. Hanukkah. Pentecost. Hmm. The correct answer is Passover. The Jewish Passover meal was also a sacrifice and offering to the Lord. After the escape from Egypt, Moses sacrificed young bulls at Mount Sinai, splashed some of their blood on God's altar, and sprinkled some on the people. This was a covenant sacrifice expressing the union between God and his people. At the time of Jesus, lambs for Passover were slaughtered at the temple. Their blood was shed and their flesh was eaten with unleavened bread. The Israelites thereby recalled the Exodus and renewed their covenant with God. In the Eucharist, Catholics recall their Exodus from the slavery of sin and death to the freedom and light of the gospel. And as the priest says at the consecration of the wine, their new and everlasting covenant with God. Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. One of the most familiar depictions of the Last Supper when Jesus instituted the Eucharist the night before he died. Which of the following best describes the Mass as we know it today? Sacrifice, banquet, reenactment, or all of the above? Sacrifice. Reenactment. Sacrifice. Banquet. Sacrifice. A reenactment. Sacrifice. Oh, it's a banquet. The correct answer is all of the above. When Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, he told his disciples, No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. He made it clear that the supper was intimately linked to his coming death. He took bread, broke it as a sign his body would be broken on the cross, and said, This is my body, which will be given for you. He took the wine and said, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. This is why Catholics speak of the Eucharist as a sacrifice. Jesus gave his life. He shed his blood for us. In doing so, he established a new covenant between God and us. As the Last Supper anticipated Christ's death on the cross, so each celebration of the Eucharist remembers that death. We also call the Eucharist a meal. We do this because Paul called it a supper, 
Jesus spoke of it as food and drink. Its elements are food and drink, or all of the above. Well, it's uh, symbolic partaking in, in, the, in the death of Jesus Christ, both the body and the blood. It's the remembering that Jesus um, suffered and died, and, and as we take in that body, we truly are we are living and taking Jesus' body at that time. It's uh, coming together with that celebration and remembrance of that. The meal is uh, uh, Jesus' primary way of, uh, of gathering with the people and of, uh, of showing his love and concern for the people. Jesus spoke of it as food and drink. The correct answer here is also all of the above. The Eucharist is a meal. Christ gave us the Eucharist at a Passover meal, and he chose food and drink as the elements to be changed into his presence. The early Christians saw the celebration of the Eucharist as a meal. St. Paul called it the Lord's Supper. Jesus spoke of the Eucharist as food and drink. Jesus said, my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Jesus wants us to draw a parallel between what food and drink do for us and what the Eucharist does for us. Food and drink nourish our body and become our body. The Eucharist nourishes us, but in this case we become what we receive. We are transformed into Christ. The Eucharist is union with Jesus and union with each other. Traditionally, Catholics have referred to the reception of Jesus in the Eucharist as Holy Communion. We said the Eucharist was a reenactment, too. The Church's coming together for worship in the Eucharist and other sacraments to make present, once again, the saving words and deeds of Christ is called novenas, sacramentals, retreats, or liturgy. Liturgy. Sacramentals. It's the liturgy, it's the sacramental, it's what we are. It's, it's, it's the combination of everything that we believe, the sacrifice of the Mass. The correct answer is liturgy. The word liturgy means work, and the liturgy is certainly one of the most important works of the Church. Liturgy embraces all official worship of the Church, but it is often used to refer specifically to the Mass, a memorial, not to someone dead and gone, but to Christ who is alive and will come again. At every Eucharist, Catholics look with confidence to that day when Christ will come to lead us through death to everlasting life. Liturgy is the holy ground where both Jesus and his people come in order to continue the mission of Jesus in the world today, his mission of salvation. The liturgy of the Mass is divided into principal parts. They are the Offertory, Consecration, and Communion, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, or the Homily, Collection, and the Sign of Peace. Offertory, Concentration, and uh, the, the Communion. The Word, well, the Gathering, the Word, the Eucharist, and the actually the putting forth of the people out into the community, really. The Liturgy of the Word, the Liturgy of the Eucharist. The correct answer is the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. There are still two or three generations of Catholics alive who are taught that the principal parts of the Mass were the Offertory, Consecration, and Communion. And as long as they made it to church in time for these, they fulfilled their Sunday obligation. We know that this is a very minimalistic way to look at our worship, and today we encourage all Catholics to be in church for the very start of Mass and to stay to its very conclusion, not just to fulfill an obligation, but to give praise and glory to God. So today we divide the Mass into two equally important parts, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, where Christ is present in each in a special way. The Offertory, Consecration, and Communion, although still central to the Mass, are important moments proper to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Which of the following is not part of the Liturgy of the Word? The Gathering Song, the Sign of the Cross, the Penitential Rite, or the Recitation of the Creed? The Gathering Song. 
Gathering song. The Creed. The correct answer is The Gathering Song. Here's why. The Gathering, our entrance song, is a call to worship. The liturgy of the word actually begins with the sign of the cross and greetings exchanged by priest and people. Then, the penitential rite. At the penitential rite, the president of the assembly asks the gathered to recall their sins. Why? To make people feel bad? To seek and accept God's forgiveness? Or to remind them to go to confession? Well, we need to go back to that valley every once in a while and search ourselves and go inward. Paul say, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. We are asked to recall our sins for forgiveness so we can be forgiven. The only way to be forgiven is to face up to him. We're asked to recall our sins because we all fall short of his glory and we need to be reminded of that, that we need his mercy. The correct answer is to seek and accept God's forgiveness. Jesus frequently and deliberately sat down and ate meals with outcasts, not only with his own bunch of uneducated and rough-mannered Galilean fishermen, but much worse, he insisted on welcoming even the despised, tax collectors and prostitutes. One of the central features of the message of Jesus is the challenge of forgiveness of sins and our accepting the offer of the possibility of a new kind of relationship with God and with God's people. This is sought at the beginning of Mass and symbolized by a table fellowship which celebrates the present joy and anticipates the future. After the penitential rite, the Gloria, a prayer of praise, is sung. Then the priest prays the opening prayer, a prayer that gathers the people's prayers into one unified whole. Then it is time for the scripture readings, which make up the heart of the Liturgy of the Word. True or false, if we go to Mass every Sunday for a year, the readings heard during the Liturgy of the Word will give us a complete reading of the scriptures. True or false? I'd say no, false. <laughs> No, we won't. And false. The answer is false. The usual pattern for Sundays and special feasts is a first reading from the Old Testament, a responsorial psalm, a second reading from the New Testament book, an acclamation verse, and a reading from the Gospel. These readings are spread out over a three-year period or cycle that will give the assembly a hearing of most, but not all, of the sacred scriptures. On Sundays and major feasts, the assembly professes its faith by praying the creed. The liturgy of the word closes with the prayer of the faithful in which we place our needs before God. The creed we recite was formulated at an ecumenical council. This council occurred at Ephesus, Nicaea, Rome, or Jerusalem. Nicaea. I don't know if it's wrong. Is it wrong? Nicaea. The correct answer is Nicaea. It is true that we have statements of belief. A typical and important example of one of these statements is the Nicene Creed, recited and professed every Sunday in the Catholic liturgy. Sometimes we get the impression from the Creed that all the work has been done. While it is true that many of the doctrines have been defined and must be believed by Catholics, we nonetheless grow in our own personal faith with them. The creed begins with the words, we believe in. We might better translate the beginning of the creed as, we believe into, meaning we are growing toward this belief more and more each day. The second part of the Mass is the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Eucharist is a Greek word, meaning worship, communion, thanksgiving, or the real presence. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I guess the real presence. The answer is Thanksgiving. In the liturgy of the Eucharist, we not only remember everything Jesus did, but, and this is the wonder of it all, Jesus becomes present and with his people accomplishes what it is they are remembering. 
In the liturgy of the Eucharist, we remember what Jesus did at the Last Supper in Calvary, and Jesus is present again in the bread and wine. It accomplishes what it remembers, the actions of Jesus by which he continues to save us, to change us, to redeem us. And for that, we express our thanks, which is what the word Eucharist means. Here's a true or false question for you. The offertory prayers we use at Mass are Jewish in origin. True or false? True. True. I believe so. The correct answer is true. The prayers that accompany the preparation of the gifts are Jewish in origin. They're beautiful. They praise God, the Creator, for all good gifts and offer to Him what we have made of them through the work of human hands. We offer the gifts of bread and wine as a symbolic return to God of all we are and ask that they be transformed into the bread of life and the cup of salvation. This is also a true or false question. For the Jews of Christ's time, body meant the person, and blood was the source of life. Therefore, when Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, he was saying, this is myself. True or false? Uh, true. Yes, true. False. The answer is true. When his listeners objected to Jesus declaring himself the bread of life, he declared, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. These words stunned his disciples. They said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? Many returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. But Jesus did not call out, Wait, you misunderstood. I didn't mean that the bread is my body, but that it only represents my body. Instead, he asked his apostles, do you also want to leave? Jesus did not water down his statement. During the liturgy of the Eucharist, the separate consecration of bread and wine shows that Christ's body is present only in the bread, causes Christ to die again, is a sign that Christ's blood was separated from his body on the cross or repeats the crucifixion? Um, because Christ separated it at the Last Supper and we were just following his promptings and according to the gospel. He separated from, from the body. Because to show it's the body and blood of Christ separately. The correct answer is a sign that Christ's blood was separated from his body on the cross. When the Eucharist is celebrated today, Christ's blood is not separated from his body as it was during his passion. The Christ who becomes present at the words of consecration is the risen, glorified Christ. Catholics believe that Christ is fully present in both the bread and wine, and that we receive Christ when we communicate under the form of either bread or wine. At the same time, we remember that Christ once gave his life for us in the sacrifice of Calvary, and the separate words of institution are a ritual reminder of that. What term expresses Catholic belief that the substance of bread and wine becomes Christ while the appearances of bread and wine remain? Transignification, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, or transformation? Uh, I'd say transubstantiation. Transignification. Transubstantiation. Transformation. Consubstantiation. The correct answer is transubstantiation. Catholics believe that when Jesus said the words, this is my body, this is my blood, he meant exactly what he said. The traditional theological term for this miracle is transubstantiation. It means that the substance of the bread and wine becomes the substance of Christ's body and blood, while the appearances of the bread and wine remain. When a priest says the words of Jesus, the words of consecration, over the bread and wine, they still retain the appearance and the taste of bread and wine, but they become Christ himself, who is then as truly present to us as he was to the apostles. 
The best expression of Catholic belief about the Eucharist is that it repeats the death of Christ, makes present the death of Christ, symbolizes the death of Christ, or allows Christ to die again for us. Repeats the death of Christ. Makes present the death of Christ. It symbolizes the death of Christ. Every time we celebrate the last, we have the last supper with the Lord, and then the final uh, a resurrection every Sunday, I think, and just the spirit, yeah, and the resurrection of the Lord. Makes present the death of Christ. If you said makes present the death of Christ, here's why you chose the correct answer. The rituals performed by the principal celebrant at Mass are not a stylized reenacting of the slaying of Jesus. Jesus doesn't die again in every Mass. Christ our Lord could die only once. He will never die again. Theologian James Burchill gives the correct doctrine. There is nothing in the Eucharist, in its present or past forms, which is a pantomime of Jesus' death. The rituals we have are the rituals of a supper. But it is at this supper, as we enter into these stories of the past, as we realize again and again how thankful we are for the things which are not simply valuable, but are God's loving gifts to us, as we link arms and selves around the table and celebrate the fact that we are family, we also lay before the Lord our life, more powerfully even than in the physical pouring out of blood. So the Mass is a sacrifice, a sacramental sacrifice, that allows us to enter into the only sacrifice worthy of the Lord to whom it was offered, the sacrifice of Jesus' death. One often hears Catholics express this preference. I prefer to worship God in meditation and private prayer. Church is a matter between God and me. So yes or no? Is this a valid Eucharistic spirituality? Yes or no? I do think church is not just something passive, but it's something actively. If we're in to celebrate together and we're rejoicing, I know my bones and my blood wasn't meant to just sit there. Amen. It's like to really rejoice and say it, say it loud, say it proud, and say it ongoing. Actively participate, definitely. You know, uh, why? why? Uh, because it gives me freedom. I free myself from the things that I came here with. You know, I'm able to express the joy that a lot of places you can't express, but in your church. You know, so I participate. I like it. No, it's not. I think it's community. The answer is no. The role of an individual as part of a gathered assembly is not simply to be present and observe what the liturgical ministers are doing or to even be totally absorbed in one's own world. The assembled people are called to active participation at the liturgy. When we receive Christ in Holy Communion, He unites us not only to Himself, but also to one another. This prescribes not only a vertical relationship with the Lord, but a horizontal relationship with each person present. Perhaps more effectively than any of the other ministers, the people in the assembly are able to make a given liturgy truly come alive by performing the action of liturgy, by singing, responding, reflecting in silence, and listening. The assembly ministers to one another. They build up the body of Christ by helping one another to experience more clearly the presence of Jesus in the word and sacrament. Through the interaction of a conscientious presiding priest, well-prepared liturgical ministers, and an alert assembly, the faithful become more and more that community of believers, each member with his or her own unique gifts, working together to build up the one body of Christ. Catholics fully participate in the celebration of the Eucharist when they receive Holy Communion in fulfillment of Christ's command to eat his body and drink his blood. To be properly prepared to receive communion, Catholics must meet all of the following conditions except fast for an hour, except water and medicine, live in charity with others, be free of grave sin, or go to confession if conscious of venial sin. Live in charity with others. Go to confession if you're conscious of a venial sin. 
fast for an hour. To be properly prepared to receive Holy Communion, you do not need to go to confession if conscious of only venial sin. Persons conscious of grave sin must first be reconciled with God and the Church through the sacrament of penance. Fasting for an hour before reception is a way of showing respect for the visitor we welcome into our own person at Holy Communion. Living in charity with others is both a preparation and a result of our relationship with Jesus in this sacrament. True or false, non-Catholic Christians are welcome to attend Mass and receive communion whenever they attend a Catholic Mass. True or false? Uh, they're not supposed to receive communion, but I guess they're welcome to if they want to. I, they're not supposed to. True. True. The answer to the first part is true. The answer to the last part is false. Non-Catholic Christians are most welcome to attend Mass, but the Catholic Church cannot extend to them a general invitation to receive communion because this would imply a unity of belief, life, and worship that does not yet exist. Incidentally, you might be at a Catholic Church that practices dismissal. This is not an exclusion but a right by which non-Catholics, preparing to join the church, leave Mass after the homily so as to participate in their own special word service in preparation for entrance into the church. The life we receive at baptism requires spiritual food and drink given to us by Christ in the Eucharist, a meal that nourishes, unites, remembers, celebrates, and anticipates. Just as food and drink nourish our body and become our body, so the Eucharist nourishes us, and Christ is transformed into us. The Mass does not depend on any one thing for its value or meaning. There are prayers and scripture readings which never lose their power as God's Word. There are the avenues of sight, scent, sound, touch and taste by which we draw closer to heaven. There is always the Lord. The church may be humble, the singing off key, the preacher ordinary. But at Christ's words, this is my body, all limitations are stripped away and we stand in the very presence of God. It's above all at the Eucharist that we make St. Paul's wish our own. All I want is to know Christ and to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death in the hope that I myself will be raised from death to life.